welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hey there. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I'm today's host, Kate Stevenson. You can find me on Reddit and Twitter as Sun Against Gold. More importantly, my guest today is Anya Jabor. She's a professor of history and women's studies at the University of Montana. And from what I gather from reading her online profile and list of teaching awards, they're best professor. We're here today to talk about the most recent of her six books, Sophonisba Nisba Breckenridge, Championing Women's Activism in Modern America. It's an alternative history of first wave feminism that is also, and I'm sure I'm forgetting something, a history of women's higher education, women's suffrage, social work, labor activism, children's welfare, social security, international feminism, pacifism, the changing nature of women's friendships, that touches on the foundation of the NAACP and efforts to help Jewish intellectuals escape from Nazi Germany, and the participation and leadership in all of those by a woman who did math problems to relax. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Anya. Thank you for having me. I get to talk about the biographies of the people that I study. Like, we think she was born sometime around 1370, maybe? Another guess is 1380, but your book makes me feel like you knew Breckenridge firsthand. Could you start by giving us a brief overview of her life, if brief is even possible? Sure, I'll do my best. And it is challenging. In fact, I had butcher paper timelines covering all four walls of my office while I was working on this book. So, so brief is a little is a little challenging, but Breckenridge was born just after the Civil War, and she lived a very long and productive life and did not die until after World War II. And in between 1866 and 1948, she engaged in just an incredible array of activities, including promoting higher education, women's suffrage, child welfare, African-American rights, immigrant welfare, pacifism, internationalism, and and a few other things too. Yeah, so that's that's about as brief as I can make it. Her life is kind of like a a checklist of women and progressive reform, progressive with a small p, reform throughout, you know, the late 19th and the first half of the 20th century. Yeah, one of the things I thought was really interesting was that at every step something would get started and then she would say, "Oh my gosh, I have to do this." and like take over. Well, she definitely got involved, although one of the things that's interesting about her and I think is part of the reason that she's been overlooked is that she really liked to sort of lead from behind. She was so she was frequently the second in command, so not the official figurehead even if she was a vital part of name that social movement, but she would take second place and uh and it seems like in many cases she did that on purpose. She says, I like being the little person behind the scenes in the New Deal, but then elsewhere she's kind not complaining, but just kind of saying, yeah, well, I'm always the assistant to the head, the assistant right. to the dean, never the assistant dean. Right, right, yeah, and I think it depends on the context. So sometimes she was uh, a little resentful, I think, that she was second in command, but when she talks about it in that way, it's usually because she was complaining about gender discrimination. So where she discusses that she was only assistant to the dean, she was talking about that in the context of her frustration that she was unable to get a faculty position for, well, decades, actually, while the men in her classes easily went on and got tenure line faculty positions. But after that, then she tended to purposely choose to play second fiddle. So like, for instance, when when she finally managed to orchestrate the establishment of the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, she insisted that Edith Abbott should be the official dean of the school rather than herself. Her students called her Miss Breckenridge, and she seems to have been perfectly fine with that. But when she was on a conference program and the conference organizers referred to her and to Edith Abbott as Miss Abbott and Miss Breckenridge, then she got quite starchy 
and she corrected them and said that you know they did in fact both have doctorates and so dr breckenridge and dr abbott would be would be perfectly fine thank you very much so while she was willing to be less formal i mean not that miss breckenridge sounds less formal to us but she didn't insist on the title with her students when it came to the outside world she was definitely aware that sometimes women were not getting the same status as men. All right. In the preface to your book, you provide a little peek at how you discovered Breckenridge and then, I guess, discovered Breckenridge. Right. Um, and I was especially struck by how the beginning of the story includes microfilm and binders, and as you said, butcher paper. And at yes. the end, it's all like PDFs, computer screens. So what is it like to build a real biography from nothing? That's a great question. So because this project evolved over such a long time period, I worked on it for a decade. The, the, the earliest work was, yeah, using really old fashioned technology like microfilm because largest single collection of our papers is on 37 reels of microfilm. And that is the only way to get them other than going to the Library of Congress to see them in person. But then by the time I was five or six years into the research, some of the materials that had previously only been available on microfilm had been digitized, like the records of the League of Women Voters, for example. So that made the process easier and meant that, I guess, that it only took 10 years instead of, instead of 20, because I did not have to physically go look at all of those. So really, I started, I started actually just with a timeline. The butcher paper was really the first part of it, marking down on that butcher paper, oh, this is the year, and then she did this on that year, and beginning to construct a, a timeline even before I tried to construct a narrative. And another thing that I did early on was to create kind of a family tree, but an intellectual family tree, right? So trying to trace her, her intellectual uh, forebears and where she was getting her ideas from. And, uh, and then another one was creating these Venn diagrams of her overlapping circles of social reform and figuring out sort of where those where those networks intersected and how that, you know, how the individuals in them and the issues involved in them related to one another so that it all ended up being of the same piece, even though on the one hand, way over here, we have a foster care program for African Americans in Chicago. And then over here, we have international pacifism and women's involvement in the in combating the traffic in women by way of the League of Nations. And then on the other hand, you've got, she wrote her dissertation on legal tender. Right. <laughs> it's probably the least interesting thing she ever wrote. So that's the other thing. While she is doing all of these things, and while she is founding organizations and resigning from organizations and being vice president of organizations with 100,000 acronyms, you did a majestic job of keeping those straight. She's also still teaching college. She's also still publishing academic research, and she's also researching. She is not your ivory tower academic. Yes, definitely not. And I mean, she was just incredibly busy. And certain points I would look and, you know, just in a single day, there'd be 20 or 30 outgoing letters from her on 20 or 30 different topics. And she was working on all of those things simultaneously. I mean, it's really quite astounding. And they're all getting out into the community. Because um, one of the things, you know, she, she was at the University of Chicago. It's where she went to um, graduate school. It's where she went to law school. And, and it's where she was dean. And then it's where she was faculty. Mm -hmm. Or you mentioned a little bit that how she was committed to that city. What was so attractive about Chicago for her at that time? The initial attraction of Chicago was that it was home to the University of Chicago, which was a new, at the time she went there, co-educational institution, and one that actually welcomed female students into its graduate programs and offered them fellowships. That was a not exactly unique opportunity, but still quite a very unusual opportunity. But the other thing about Chicago, or another thing about Chicago, 
is that the faculty there at the time that Breckenridge went there and also taught there was that they regarded the city itself as kind of a laboratory for social experimentation. So their idea was not at all to be sort of cloistered academics hiding away in their ivory tower, but that they wanted to come up with you know, ideas grounded in social scientific research to address pressing social problems. And look, the city was actually going to be their test laboratory to try out their theories and apply their theories. So that was another thing that was very attractive to her. Another thing that was really important for Breckenridge in terms of why Chicago is because there was a really vibrant women's reform community. Hull House had been established just a few years before Breckenridge relocated to Chicago and became this kind of mecca for reform-minded people, mostly women, but some men as well. And there, so there was this kind of built-in community of like-minded people for her to engage with. And then finally, she had a, a weird connection to Chicago by way of Wellesley in that she went there to initially to visit a former classmate of hers at Wellesley, who then introduced her to Marion Talbot, who was the new dean of women, who had formerly been a faculty member at Wellesley. So the Wellesley connection, in a strange kind of way, brought Breckenridge to the University of Chicago, and then she decided to make Chicago her permanent home. And when she was when she's doing this research, I thought it was interesting how very statistics based it was. And you know, you you stress that throughout even some of her later work in like the the 1910s, the 1920s, yeah. that this is all very statistics based. Yes, it is. And one of the things this is actually one of the things that there's not as much of in the book as there there could have been is her actual research, the findings of her actual research. Her papers have not just drafts of the manuscripts and articles that she produced, but actually have the original documentation, the original card files, or the original data sheets with, you know, the sort of questions that were being asked or the data that was being collected. And hundreds and hundreds of questionnaires of the original questionnaires are in her papers. So there's, I mean, there's far more there than what I was able to include in a biography of her. I mean, one could write an entire book just about Sophie Nesba Breckenridge's contributions to social science, if one were, you know, so minded. But actually, that that's, that's a good connection um, to the next point I want to bring up, which is that the founding narrative of her life really, you could say, is feminism, but it's not really or it can't be measured by like the benchmarks or the debates of modern feminism, um, mm -hmm. especially like when you talk about women's work and women's areas of study in school, we have sort of a stereotype of women do qualitative, men do quantitative, and you know, women's subjects are inferior, women's work is just what's less paid. Um, you know, she's a founding member of sort of social work as a discipline and as an area of actual work and my friends who majored in social work are all female and mm -hmm. have a club called I majored in something I love and now I live in a box <laughs> uh -huh. but it means something very very different in 1904 in 1910 in 1920 to be an area of women's study and women's work yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the field is now, you know, it's definitely a feminized field, and it's unfortunately one that does not get the status or the pay that its practitioners deserve. But for Breckenridge, it was an opportunity. She was pioneering this field in which she could apply the knowledge that she gained from her graduate studies in political science and political economy, and she could use her expertise in collecting and analyzing social statistics, but she could do it in a field that, that was a brand new field that she helped to create because she had found to her sorrow that it didn't matter that she, you know, graduated at the top of her class, she still couldn't get a job in political science or in political economy or in sociology. So yeah, so for her, 
opening up this new field of endeavor that was going to be this kind of female friendly profession was an opportunity, not a ghetto. And then feminism comes up in the different chapters. And one of the running themes of it is fairness versus equality Mm -hmm. in terms of whether women need special protective legislation or whether everything just needs to be straight up genderless. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting comparison for me. Like today, usually the people who talk about specialness of women and the specialness of men, it's usually a conservative perspective that either comes from a certain category of men we'd associate with the red pill or from conservative Christianity where you get gender complementarianism. Mm -hmm. And it's completely different in Breckenridge's Mm -hmm. lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. And for Breckenridge and a lot of other women activists in, in the kind of circles she was involved with, so the women's organizations that were especially concerned about the situation for working women, for example, were very much concerned with acknowledging the ways in which women were differently positioned in the world, and they wanted to create a level playing field so that women could have equal opportunity. But in order to do that, Breckenridge and many of her allies believed that they had to acknowledge the ways in which women were different, or at least were differently positioned in the world. So Breckenridge frequently said, you know, that there's nothing less equal than calling unequals equal, right? That it was pointless to kind of deny that women had greater responsibility for domestic life than did men, or to deny that women were concentrated in professions that tended not to be unionized. And so you had to acknowledge those differences and offset the differences using the law in order to then allow women to achieve their full potential. So she always tried to keep that notion of equality well qualified. So she talked about things like effective equality or true equality or practical equality, by which she meant that women would have equal opportunity, but the only way for them to have equal opportunity was to take into account their unique gendered circumstances. This served her especially especially well, you mentioned, when she went to uh, the seventh Pan American Conference on Feminism, which is mm-hmm. basically when um, North American, especially U.S. feminists got together with Latin American feminists. And that's right. a really interesting thing for us to hear about because, you know, today we have the stereotype of, quote unquote, white feminism, you know, not without reason. But here she is, the U.S. feminist who can relate, who does relate. Right. Certainly there were were some Latin American feminists who did not share this position, but a lot of Latin American feminists at that time did emphasize women's differences from men, not in the sense that they were celebrating them so much as that they were acknowledging them and they wanted to address women's needs as citizens, but as citizens who had, and as workers, but as citizens and workers who had different needs and different demands than did men. And that was a pretty common outlook for Latin American feminists that gave them common ground with Breckenridge, whereas it meant that they did not necessarily support Dora Stevens and her proposals for an equal rights treaty and an equal nationality treaty. Although again, some did, right? So, I mean, on both from the US side of things and from the Latin American side of things, there were people who were committed to, you know, absolute equality in the sense of absolute sameness, and there were people who were committed to this principle of fairness that required acknowledging women's differences from men, but on balance, I think Breckenridge's tendency to want to take the bigger picture of fairness into account gave her a lot of common ground with many Latin American feminists. She's also out there, you mentioned, writing a guide for women voters. She runs for older person. She's the daughter of a congressperson. Right. So political civil rights, she's all about those, but in an also kind of sense. Yes, exactly. So she, I mean, in a way, I think she kind of anticipates this idea that human rights include political and civil rights, 
and also social and economic rights that before before people talked about human rights as human rights as encompassing all of those things that was her vision of being treated as a fully equal person was addressing individuals social and economic standing as well as their political and civil standing while we're on the subject of splits within feminism I got a really, I got a different and really, really interesting and cool understanding of the women's suffrage movement of the 1900s and 1910s through Breckenridge's eyes or through you, through her eyes. Sure. Well, again, I think part of what's going on for Breckenridge is that she was committed to women's equality, but she, and also she was committed um, to other things. She was committed to improving the lives of working people. She was in committed to improving the lives of immigrants. She was dedicated to improving the lives of African Americans. So she always had this very broad view of what equality meant. And in some ways, although that ultimately would pit her against the women of the National Women's Party who were promoting the Equal Rights Amendment after the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, during the suffrage struggle itself, it meant that, for example, she resisted adopting the increasingly exclusionary tactics of some suffrage leaders. So, for instance, W.E.B. Du Bois had criticized Anna Howard Shaw, who was then president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, because Shaw had refused to allow, at the annual convention in 1911, had refused to allow a black woman to introduce a resolution basically saying that rights for American women and rights for African Americans were fundamentally linked, right? That they were common enterprises. And Du Bois criticized Shaw for blocking that resolution and warned that the movement was in danger of becoming a movement for white women only. And then when Breckenridge was vice president, she invited Du Bois to speak at the next annual convention in 1912 in which he basically gave a whole speech that was that resolution that said that it wasn't just a fight for women's rights, it was a fight for universal rights, and that meant that what was really needed was what he called a democracy of sex and color, right? So tying those movements together. And that was that was not the direction that the suffrage movement was going in at that moment in time in general. But I think, again, that Breckenridge's expansive notion of equality and the ways that equality needed to take into account all kinds of differences and acknowledge difference while still demanding equality was part of what allowed her to resist the trend toward excluding African Americans and and other people from the suffrage movement. Yeah, and as both at the University of Chicago and then later on in the suffrage movement, she was also active in inviting black women to join, specifically. Yes, yes. And yeah, and so for instance, she was she was a friend of of Ida B. Wells, and they they corresponded. So absolutely. When she split away at first from the National American Woman Suffrage Association, she called her new organization the Women's Peace Party. Right. So how did she see the pacifist movement as a specifically women's issue? That's a really great question, and. The way that she saw it is a little bit different from the way many of her colleagues saw it. So a lot of people who joined the Women's Peace Party did so because they believed that women, more than men, uh, had a particular interest in peace because as mothers or as potential mothers, they had a special responsibility for protecting and preserving human life. Breckenridge never sort of disagreed with that. Um, But she, instead of talking about being a pacifist as a woman, she tended to talk about being a pacifist as a social worker. Um, And so she took the position that, you know, war was detrimental to her mission and to what she regarded as all social workers' mission to ensure social and economic equality and protection and opportunity to all, so that it wasn't so much that she was framing herself as a mother with a special interest in peace, but as a social worker with a special interest in peace. 
So it was a little bit different than some of her colleagues in the movement, like Crystal Eastman or Jane Addams, who used more maternalistic statements. And hers tended not to be quite that focused on women's identity as mothers, but rather on her professional identity as a social worker, rather than her gendered identity as somebody who had the capacity to become a mother. Did she bring that same self-positioning to her work with children and her activism on behalf of children? Yes and no. I mean, certainly she worked with a lot of people on child welfare issues, you know, at the state level, at the national level, at the international level. And many of those people probably would have seen themselves as acting out of this interest as women in child welfare because they were women and thus were sort of naturally inclined to look after children. Breckenridge there, again, kind of relied on on her professional expertise. So she used, you know, statistics to prove that children from less well-off families were more likely to be caught up in crime and thus in the juvenile court system. And so she tended to use more statistical arguments rather than, I guess, emotional arguments. One of the things I thought was really interesting about the book itself was that the beginning and the end, the first three chapters and the last chapter were more narratives of her personal life. Uh, The in the middle part is all focused by subjects of her activism. Throughout all that section, you would drop teasers about her emotional life but it's really not a traditional biography at all. The trenchantly personal is in there, but not really for most of the book. Right. Yeah, that was something that that I really worked hard on. I mean, this was one of the challenges about working on a biography of somebody who did so many things and accomplished so much is that, I mean, it almost becomes like a resume, right, of her professional accomplishments. And, um, and, And she you know, could get lost, you know, her as a person um, could get lost. And that is partly due to the nature of the source material. I mean, the, you know, the vast bulk of sources by and about her, of course, are about her professional accomplishments or her political achievements. But, um, but I also wanted to, you know, get to know her as a person and to convey a sense of her as a person, not, you know, not just as a a figurehead. And so as much as I could, I looked for those places where you got kind of somewhere in her papers, you got a hint of, oh, this is how she felt about this, or oh, this is probably why she cared so deeply about this issue. So for instance, um, she was a very strong supporter of the Shepard Towner Act, uh, better known by its supporters as the Maternity and Infancy Act, which uh, provided for uh, federal subsidies for health care programs for poor women and um, their newborns, especially in rural areas in the 1920s. And, and she was, you know, a passionate defender of that act, and she was crushed um, when finally its funding uh, was pulled just in time for the Great Depression. And I think that part of the reason that she felt so strongly about that particular program is because she had lost siblings. Um, uh, she, several of her siblings had died um, when they were very young and while she was still a child. And her own mother suffered from very poor health um, throughout Breckenridge's childhood and teenage years and then, and then died young. So trying to make those connections between like, here's something that was going on in her personal life and here's how it uh, connected with her political. One of the things that I didn't mention that this is also a history of because I was just listening, listing the activism things is the changing nature of society's ideas of women's friendships from what's been called romantic friendships or really close partnerships, Boston marriages in the late 19th century to sort of a lesbians versus friends, strict dichotomy. So at the time that Breckenridge came of age and and formed her most important intimate relationships, first with Marion Talbot and then with Edith Abbott, she was still operating in that kind of Victorian era idea that women were devoid of sexual passion and that therefore, no matter how intense their 
emotional connection might be that they were not sexual, right? And then, of course, by the time Breckenridge died, the ground had really kind of shifted and under her feet in terms of attitudes about that. And women's relationships with one another had become recognized as potentially sexual and consequently had been demonized and stigmatized as being mental illness or sexual perversion. And I mean, I think maybe not surprisingly, I think Breckenridge mostly just sort of thought continued operating in the older mode that she had come of age in and that made sense for her. And even though all of her friends and her students and her political allies all openly talked about her relationships, uh, first with Marion Talbot and then with Edith Abbott, nobody ever named it as lesbian, including Breckenridge and Talbot and Abbott, right? They flew under the radar, right? They had these relationships that everyone knew about, everyone talked about, everyone always asked, you know, Abbott about Breckenridge or asked Breckenridge about Abbott and assumed that they would do everything together and share everything with one another, as indeed they did, but without ever raising the specter of lesbianism, which would have been damaging to the women personally, professionally, and politically. I'm about to spoil the best quote in the book, if you don't mind. Contemporaries compared Abbott and Breckenridge as teachers and thought they were similar. Mm -hmm. And so you include an mm -hmm. anecdote about Abbott's teaching where she says, asks a student, how are you getting along? The student says, pretty well, except I haven't been able to do anything about my thesis. Abbott says, why not? Student, well, I study every night until 11. And of course, Abbott answers, what do you do between 11 and 1? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a great story. I love the stuff about the teaching, of course, since I'm, you know, since I'm a college professor, right? I love that stuff. And of course, Breckenridge is the anecdote that circulates about Breckenridge in the same way is that she says, when she's talking to somebody, and he says, you know, that he's having a hard time keeping up with his work, because he gets tired. And she says, well, you must remember that the work of the world does not get done by going to bed when you get sleepy. Did she ever apologize for anything? You quote Doris Stevens at the um, Pan American Conference as what, she's a bitch and a witch and she leaves my ass tired? I wouldn't say that she ever apologized for any of the positions that she took on major issues. She certainly never apologized for her opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment. She was absolutely sure she was correct about that. She never apologized for being a pacifist. She never, never... Uh, apologized for uh, her particular approach to social work that emphasized um, the structural causes of poverty as opposed to, you know, individual adjustment. And before we go, I've got one final question for you. Okay. Do you have any plans to publish what you mentioned, Breckenridge's unfinished biography, autobiography, her memoirs, her letters? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so her, um, so her uh, unfinished uh, autobiography, um, it, I, I did actually um, edit, and, um, and it has been published in a book uh, that's co-edited by Gazelle Roberts and Melissa Walker called Southern Women in the Progressive Era. So, um, so, that, so that source, which previously, you know, was only available in a very very disorganized and confusing form it's you know it's partly it's partly typewritten it's partly handwritten there are multiple drafts of certain sections of it that include different information there's all kinds of crossovers and insertions i mean it's it's not it's not a it's not an incredibly user friendly um uh source uh so that is actually uh, has already been published um, I would like to, I mean, Breckenridge's papers are just, I mean, they're, they're way too, I mean, way too immense to even imagine, like, doing, you know, the critical edition of the Sofin is the Breckenridge papers. I mean, that would be like a 30-year a enterpri <laughs> enterprise. Um, but I have thought that I would like to, for instance, maybe publish a selection of her letters that documented her relationship with Edith Abbott, because... Um, those letters are just, um, I mean, they're so sweet and they're, 
and they're so special and they just they, they just show her they just show her in such a different light i mean i think i say a little bit about this in the book but whereas her professional correspondent is ultra professional right i mean she's she just exudes confidence and competence and never shows any doubt or fear or anxiety um, in her professional correspondence. But in her personal correspondence uh, with Abbott, and, and to a lesser extent, her personal correspondence with Talbot, you know, she's uncertain, she's sad, she's anxious, she, she doubts herself, she wonders if, you know, if she's made some made some kind of terrible mistake and hurt the other person's feelings. I mean, it's just a really different, it's just a really different um, view of her than the one that she chose to present to most of the world. And so um, if I were to, you know, do another project of editing her original materials, I think that is probably where I would start. Well, I can't wait to go pick up her autobiography and then if you ever get a chance, I'll be definitely reading her letters because, um, so, because all of you listening, Sophie Nisbet Breckenridge, championing women's activism in modern America from the University of Illinois Press, you need to read this book. It's great. It's almost as great as my guest today. Oh. So. Oh, thank you. That's so nice of you, Kate. I really appreciate that. So thank you for joining us, everybody. Anya Jabor. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.